at least 70% of my whole gains to full body alone. You should do every neck variation exercise as possible. So you have your flexion, you have your extension, yeah. but you also have a side lateral like that, and you have a rotation. You do not necessarily need to keep the big three and the OHP, but you need variation of them. How do you choose the variation? So I want to kick things off today talking about full body training. You mentioned that full body training is one of the most old school ways to develop a physique and has personally been responsible for most of your size and strength. Most mm -hmm. intermediate lifters have never tried full body. Can you explain yeah. why they should give it a chance in as much detail as possible? Yeah, of course, Valwin. So it's really simple. Full body is the go-to and the easiest way actually to ease into training because uh, there is something very logical about the fact that you're trying to train your body and you go in to do everything, your whole body. Um, and this uh, body part splitting philosophy really, really came after, uh, like in the 80s, if you're talking about the blow split, uh, and same thing for the PPL. So actually doing a, a full body allow you to train your whole body and then letting your uh, letting your, your body recover. And then you, when you go again, you're, you're fresh and you can eat it hard again. Basically, full body is really intensity driven with a pretty high frequency because it's possible to do every muscle three times per week, even four times, even if it's much more tricky, um, and allow ample recovery. And that is something that most people nowadays, I think, are overlooking. It's a recovery thing. Uh, if there is one day of hard training, there should be one day of hard recovering. Uh, and with full body, you're forced to do it. And that's why it works so well as a, as a uh, training template. And furthermore, there is also the fact that full body forces you to do what works. There is no like doing incline press and then the chest press and then the flies and then the pullover and then the push ups and you know a shit ton of exercise for each muscle. You are forced to do what works and we know what works. It's just that it's hard to apply. So you're training your whole body and you're forced to do like one or two exercises per muscle group max. So you're not going to do every curl in existence and you're not doing going to do every uh, leg machine that is available in your gym. You're going to do like one or two and, and done. And since you just do one or two, the opportunity to go really hard on each muscle, each training day is quite short. So you go and give it everything. So you, you're training pretty hard at the same time. So we have a template to allow you to train quite frequently, good intensity, and who forces you to recover and do uh, exercise that have been time tested, actually. And that's why it's working so well. And that's why it's quite a shame that not much people are actually trying to give it a chance. And uh, as I told in my videos, which is true, uh, we can give at least 70% of my whole gains to full body alone. Wow. And it sounds like you feel that doing full body forces you to be thoughtful and smart about exercise selection. Would you agree? Yes. Totally, because okay. you have to manage the joint fatigue, the core fatigue, the stabilization muscle fatigue, and even the exercise order in your own gym. Uh, I do not know how everyone's gym is uh, logistically speaking uh, distributed, you know, but uh, if you're in there for at least two hours, you will try to optimize your uh, moving into the gym. If you're doing full body, it allows you to basically have some kind of order and going around, you know, but not trying to go up and down and be a hand there, you know. So uh, there is this really simple practical aspect. And then there is the, as I told earlier, the joint fatigue, the core fatigue, um, the stabilization muscle fatigue. In the past, we only had barbell and dumbbell. And if you were really lucky, you had cable, handmade. Now with machines, we have Smith machines. We have convergent machines. We have uh, ascending resistance machine. We have descending resistance. I mean, you have everything. You have every tool, basically, now in most commercial, commercial gym. So we are able to train much more smarter than before and have much more option. It's like our toolbox. You know, we, you are going to do bench press for your chest. All right. You have barbell. You have dumbbell. You have... Uh, Plate-loaded machine, you have a stack machine, you have a convergent one, maybe you have rings, 
maybe you have a weighted dips uh, station, you have all these things and doing full body allow you to do quite a good variety of exercise. If we are talking chest and if you are talking about doing two exercises for chest per, uh, per training day, you have six exercises. That's simple enough to do any variation and you can choose the ones that you like and the ones that are not hurting you uh, mm -hmm. joint wise and also where you can have some progression. And this example with chest training and with any muscle, the quads, the delt, uh, the traps, the back, anything. Yeah, absolutely. It also sounds like full body training may be more, I wouldn't say more useful now, but there's a practical aspect where if you know that, you know, on your first session, your Monday session, that your joints uh, in your chest get sore because you're doing a lot of barbell work, on the Wednesday mm -hmm. session, you could choose to use machines and progress there where maybe it's a little bit more joint friendly for you. Totally. Yeah. Machine as a whole are much more joint friendly. So you can actually cycle in a way the joint stress. You can have that day where it's barbell and dumbbell, as you said, which is quite useful. It's, it's not bad, but you have to take into account that the rotator cuff, uh, the coracobra callus, all these muscles that are stabilizing the serratus anterior too, is are going to take a beating and 48 hours later, uh, your pectoral ma major, your deltoid, your triceps is a little bit fine to go. But the, is the rest really fine to go and perform as well? Uh, it depends, you know. It can be quite individual, you know, in, in it also depends on the load you use. There is a difference between doing incline press with one plate and with three plates. So having machines and doing redoing basically the kind of the same exercise but with Smith machine, for example, and I don't know, like a, an Atlantis, Atlantis chest press, you train the same muscle again, but you kind of let your joint rest um, and the stabilizing motion as well. And it allows you also to switch the resistance profile because for most weight training uh, with free weight, uh, it's harder at the bottom and it's easier at the top, like for bench press or squat, stuff like that. With machines, it depends. And it, you can also put bends onto the machines to change up the resistance curve to make it more joint friendly or not, or bias a bit more, for example, the triceps um, or the delt or, you know, whatever. And full body kind of ease you into that kind of mindset of, you know, one day you are going to go hard, one day you're going to be smart. You know, you will have to or you will stall and overuse. So I think that's why it's pretty useful. Yeah, I feel like there's also an important mental side of full body training I find interesting where the, there's almost feels like there's less pressure on each set. Um, like if you don't uh, progress on your first lift, then there's always other body parts that you can be like, okay, let's focus, let's be intense, let's progress here. So every session feels like you're making, uh, you know, forward progression even yeah. when if you're just doing like a, a bro split or something and you kind of you know don't progress on your first chest lift then the the rest of the chest exercises you you don't feel as good about it but with full body you're saying okay maybe back in it but now i can work on my shoulders or i can work on my quads and you're always progressing and then you get kind of a good feel for the exercise order the selection and you know understanding your recovery and which exercises you can really push that day totally yeah and even the exercise order itself if you have your first day of full body and you begin with chest the second day can begin with legs and your third day with i don't know back and you're still going to eat everything but you will be able to focus more each muscle group and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to start all the time with the same muscle group and let's just say you have a bad day, as you said, yeah, you have all the rest of the body to progress. And it's, it's cool, you know. And it's also uh, the actual and the error that you can see, you know, how hard you can push on day and not other days. Um, for example, when I started this thing, because for years I was forced to do full body with free weights only because I was in the gym and every machine was wrecked. And every cable was like a hinge or I don't know, something was off. You know, so there was no way for me to really go perfectly how a progression was. Uh, to give like a, a very good example, there was a shoulder machine uh, press, you know, a good one, plus strength uh, brand, it's nice, 
but on one arm you could put three plates and the other one you could put five and it was going to the same because <laughs> okay. one that get one dude that like destroyed like the the inch joint at the i mean so yeah. i was doing just barbell and, and dumbbell but when i was in vancouver canada uh and i was able to have a pretty good gym it was a steve Naff gym uh i could now do smith machine i could do uh, machine presses uh, i'm a strength which is a really nice brand and i could do free weight and then i started to try you know and that's how i discovered you know that if i can if i go in my week with really heavy machine press if i go on monday on on wednesday i can come back and do the same thing with free weights okay. but on friday i have to do smith machine and that's it or i'm i'm done uh, and it took me a while to understand that because i was thinking you know it's monday so i'm going to start hard and go immediately into a free weight I mean, it's logical. It's Monday. You go hard with free weight. But if I do that on the on witness day, I'm I'm not recovered yet. So I st I try to go hard on the machine and I can't. But the reverse work. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it might be it's individual as well. Uh, maybe it's how the machine were designed. I don't know. But you know, it's the kind of observation you cannot know in advance. You have to try and assess and do your weekly rotation and then see. Okay, am I changing this thing? Am I being more careful about that? Uh, this is not working. I'm going to switch it. This is definitely working. I'm going to keep it. And you know, you you learn as you go along. And is the split between each muscle the same on every session, or will someday be more shoulder dominant, or one day be more lower dominant? Like, is it that you're covering full body, but each section each session could be split up differently? Uh, if you're talking about me and what I do, uh, yes. It's different. It's different because uh, at my strength level, which is advanced, I cannot go hard every time on everything. It's not mm -hmm. possible. So, for example, on the full body I showed on videos, I went really hard on the chest, the shoulder, and the legs on the first day, and pretty medium onto the arms and the delt isolation, and I barely did some back. Why did I do that? Because it's the first day of the week. I don't really care much about the chest. Legs is extremely important, but if you do them later into the week, you can be like you have accumulated fatigue with the work and all the other training session. So might as well eat them good and hard on one day. And then the rest of the week you see. And my goal is arm. Plus back is a strong point. So that's okay. why I did that. But then on the second day, I do much more arms. I do a lot of... Um, I do a, a, a lot less um, pressing and it's just free weight because I'm just doing like six sets, so it can be free weight. Uh, shit ton of arms, shit ton of back on the machine. And for the legs, it's just isolation. And then on the third day, it's a little mismatch in between. There is a few machines, there is a few free weights. And on the legs, I'm doing my deadly variation that I've not eaten yet. And one day it was more like the squat variation. So on Friday, my back is good to go and my spine is ready to get the beating for deadly variation so you see it's like it's rotational if i if i was to do a graphic you know it's like it starts for the legs it starts hard and then it go down and for the other muscle it's more like this and the other one is like this so it's just rotating and the only thing that is really staying medium or high are the muscle i'm trying to develop and in my case is the arm i'm nearly at 18 inches uh, arm uh, basically a bit more than 46 centimeter and I'm nearly there but it's my goal it's it's me so the program is tailored for that if my arm were fine and I'm trying to build something else it would be totally different so again this is the kind of freedom that you have with uh, full body and right. it's really not as flexible and supple I'd say with a bro split how do you specialize your arms on a bro split you skip you skip legs and just do more arms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, and like on your presses, you go close grip or medium grip, and on your pull, you're trying to do a bit more biceps. But yet again, it, it depends so much. It's really individual at some point. So For sure. that's why full body is quite nice because you can go in with a pretty general cookie cutter training program, and as you go along, you personalize it for you with the gym you have and the uh, goals you have. And it works. Awesome. 
So something you talk about is that it's important to showcase a great physique in clothes with the t-shirt and jeans. Um, so yes. what are your Mount Rushmore, your four most important muscles for looking good in clothes? Money. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, four muscles, t-shirt and jeans. Yeah. Uh, neck. Neck, yep. uh, traps. I'd say uh, back as a whole, just for muscle. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, not not the back, uh, the forearm. Forearm. The the forearm. Yeah, yep. this this really make the whole arm go much uh, much thicker, and for the legs. Uh, I mean, it's a tie between quads and glutes because glutes really give you a 3D effect. And it's it's really good looking to have like a nice pair of glutes shaped into a gym. And it also forms it really well. But if you have big glutes and no no legs muscle, and, and the same thing with quads. If you have good quads, it, it gives like a nice shape to your whole legs. If, you're not, if your quads are not too, 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 too small, um, but you need also the 3D effect with the glutes. So I think it's tiny. Yeah, neck, traps, forearm, and glutes, or quads. Awesome. So you mentioned neck, and I think your neck transformation is very impressive. So I've been working neck in kind of extension and flexion for about a year with, I'd probably say, subpar results. I started at once a week. I'm doing twice a week. I have a neck flex, so I use it with the chain, and then I do neck curls with plate okay. on a bench. So what advice would you give to someone like me if uh, neck hypertrophy is my main priority over the next six months? If neck training is directed for hypertrophy, mm -hmm. you should do every neck variation exercise as possible. So you have your flexion, you have your extension, yeah. but you also have a side lateral like that, and you have a rotation like that. Mm. That way you can eat the neck on every single uh, function and every single little part in a sense uh, because for example for rot the rotation if I'm going from here to here it's going to work here and it's going to work there and the reverse in the other side and if you're doing your side bend you're going to rework again the uh, sternocleidoccipitomastoid muscle that you're already doing with reflection but you're yeah. also going to get the inner muscle on the side plus the scalene inside so it's going to make you much more wider appearance. Um, and you're already doing your extension. So yeah, either you cycle these exercise on three days, for example, or you do them all at once and you do just like two days. But basically neck is something that you cannot train to failure. And even if you can, you shouldn't. It's extremely dangerous. And furthermore, the nature of the fibers of a neck I mean, I, do, I didn't see any kind of study about that, but it's mostly red slow twitch muscle. It's for endurance. It's just to hold your head. You know, yep. there's no like fast movement that you're supposed to do. Like you're not a goat supposed to headbutt, right? <laughs> so actually, it's both safer, um, and um, and it makes just more sense to do more volume and not go so close to failure. And if you really need to, you have the frequency. It, it just makes sense, right? So in your case, if it's really max hypertrophy, like you do not want to be able to close the two last button on your dress shirt, yeah. um, there is one day you do flexion uh, and extension. There is another yeah. day you do the side lateral like that and you do the rotation. And then there is a third day you come again and you do one extension variation and you do uh, either the curl and or the side bend again. And since you have a neck flex, you can switch between plate free weight, the chain for extension, but you also have yeah. a bend. And since yeah. you have a chain, you can also wrap it around a uh, pulley cable and do cable make work. So you switch each time the resistance profile and you switch each time the uh, amount of work you're going to give to both the soft tissues and the muscle. So that's what I would do. And that's what I yeah. do technically. 
Yeah, I think where I find it challenging is probably on the intensity side of things because you can't take it to failure. And that's yeah. and I go typically close to failure on other exercises. So when I finish a set of like, let's say neck extension, I'm not really sure if I have three RIR or it might be eight RIR. It's kind of hard yeah. for me to gauge that. And I feel like that's probably because it's something I haven't been training as long as other muscles that I got to, I need to get a sense of how far I am away from failure because I might not really know that the way I would know that with like, um, you know, bicep or, or lateral head of the shoulder. Yeah. Awesome. That's why for neck training, I prefer to give rep, rep goals, set and reps goals. Like whatever you're doing, you're going to do five sets of 20 or okay. three sets of 30. And whatever, I'm doing... whatever, what you're feeling, you know, whatever, if it's like you feel, ah, my close to failure or not, three, three by 30, do that. And when okay. you do that and you valid, valid, validate the set and rep scheme, then you up the weight and you start again. Okay. And when you will start to have this feel about, you know, I am really, am I really close to failure? Am I having like some kind of uh, uh, local fatigue, like plus, plus the pump, you're going to be able to get that feel. But it can take some time. It's individual. Uh, I'm pretty sure genetic is at play also here. It depends on the sport you may have or may have not done in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so many factors. But that's why it's easier, in my opinion, to ease in neck training with just high rep goals in mind, whatever the weight. And as you go and progress, you get to discover how you feel and you get to discover also how it goes into your body internal cues why when you're training your neck and it's pretty hard yeah just absolutely. like any muscle actually yeah i think a lot of the guidance is like just do the flexion and the extension but i feel like for myself it's probably more of a stubborn muscle so i need to do the you know the side and the rotation and kind yeah. of hit it from I mean, all the different angles regardless if it's stubborn or not if your if your goal is max hypertrophy you should do everything like flexion okay. and extension is, is just uh, is just a minimum in a, in a sense um, because it, it's just you know if you want like some decent neck and if you're happy with the result just keep doing that but if it's max hypertrophy you want you do everything you know okay. it's it, I mean just like for any muscle group if you want big legs are you just going to do squats no of course you not. do squats you do RDL you do leg press leg extension leg curl even the adductors and you know you do everything right so here it's the same thing. Awesome. Cool. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw out some quotes that you've said in the past. Uh, give me your first thoughts on it. <laughs> I know you're already laughing. Huh? Uh, so the first one is, it's a game of consistency and endurance rather than random motivation and extra hard training here and there. Yes. Well, what does that mean to you? It means that it, between three months of really going hard and be like, yeah, I'm going to change this and that and just doing the same thing over and over again, whatever, if you're feeling good or not, uh, whatever, if it's like a, bi a big, huge, nice session uh, with the biggest pump you ever had or a bad session and you're feeling like you're starting to feel, um, to fall sick, um, fall healed, sorry. Uh, and uh, there is so many things going on in your mind I, I, at the end of the day, it's the guy with just regularly clocking in and doing the work that is going to have the most progress instead of the other one that has just random burst of motivation. But the training progress is, you know, is like that, right? So that's what, that's what it means to me. All right. Next one. Rear delts, one of the smallest and yet biggest physique breaker muscles. No rear delt means no thickness from side and back. Yeah. Totally. Got to work those retails. It's just like the neck, you know? It's like the neck is just this. And you're like, you know, it's it's, it's so little compared to chest, quads, m muscle like that. But when you have a pencil neck, your whole body, something is off, something is missing. And when you have no physique at all, and you just see like a mug shot or just a picture of a guy and he has like a tr three trunk neck, you're like, oh, this dude is huge. So it makes a difference. And for the real dance, it's the same. I mean, um, if this is missing, it's just that. So it's like sloppy, you know, don't even. 
Well, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, whatever. This little thing here can just like make your Dell pop out from a heavy, heavy angle, or it can make it look weird, like like some pieces missing. So it can make or break a physique. Okay. Uh, next one is a true Viking always keeps learning. Come again. A true Viking always keeps learning. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, the cliche about Viking is that they are like a horny helmet, uh, and they are just going like uh, in uh, in fray, and they are just paging and raiding. But at, at the first Viking raids, Viking good just mean raiders. If you're a raider, you may start trouble, or you may just here to uh, explore. It's like it's a multi multi-meaning world. Uh, some, so some Viking were just merchant and explorator. So there was always this uh, mindset of just expanding, you know, what's out there? Oh, we are supposed to be close to the end of the world because Viking for the heart was flat, you know, and if mm -hmm. you go too far, you fall. Uh, but have, you, have, have we seen the edge of the heart? No? But then we go. Let's see. You know, there's all this thing of like, hey, I need to see more. I need to, I need to show. I need to, I need to to understand. And it's like, I mean, most uh, medieval road of um, of merchant, um, they got made between what is actual France and Germany and Italia. Uh, but the one that really like clumped everything from top of Europe to the south were Vikings going from both at sea and also on the, on the road uh, uh, with horses. And they are also the ones that link to the whole kind of hub with uh, the Champagne region from France to the uh, the Silk Road in Middle Orient and like uh, Eastern Europe, I believe. Uh, they are the ones that basically made all the little connection all around to make them a big hub in, the, in between. And if there was not that, there would be no um, close guard into uh, the Constantinople uh, city, which called cross the Varangian Guard. And the Varangian Guard was coming from the Varag, and the Varag were Viking tribes. Uh, just the same as Swedes and and, uh, and, uh, and other tribes, basically. So there was always this thing, you know, of like going everywhere and seeing and learning. Yeah, I like that. So the next one, it, it, I don't know if it's uh, still Viking related. It kind of feels like it. A smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. Uh, no, Viking related, I don't know. But it just means, you know, that if you're going easy mode, you're not going to learn and to grow from it. And it's basically the same with training. If there is an easy set and it's too easy, you're not going to grow from it. You, you need some challenge to move forward. Yeah, absolutely. You almost want some challenge. Like some people want yeah. the easy path, but like if you make it with challenge, you're going to be more equipped to handle what comes next. And that's exactly. that's in fitness, more, that's in life. Yeah, it's even in video games. Awesome. You don't want to power level through something with someone, yeah. then you're not going to know how to play the game. You need to learn exactly. yourself step by step. Totally. Cool. All right, and the last one here is weak point training. You should always prioritize them and make sure to get a nice mind-muscle connection. Yes. Can you give me an example on if there was a weak point that you had ever and how you developed a mind-muscle connection? Uh, biceps. Okay. Biceps. Uh, biceps was extremely tricky for me because I was doing curls like everyone with barbell, straight or easy, and I would get a pump in my front delt and my forearm. Interesting. So I, I have no idea how is it possible because biceps is a elbow flexor and a supinator. I was in supination and I was flexing my elbow. How is my forearm and my front delt still work? How, how is it possible? I don't know. But I took me a very long time to even be able to get sore biceps. And it's only by building muscle-mind connection and making sure that it's actually the biceps that is taking the load and doing the brunt of the work that I was able to build them. Just doing weighted chin-ups didn't work. Just doing heavy curl did not work. So I had to actually get a muscle-mind connection. And what really helped me 
was um, first going into a, a pause every time I would curl. So when I'm curling, I go there, I pause, I stop. Mm. It's why I'm sure to finish in the good position and it gives me more time to flex it and the load. And the second thing was to prioritize exercise where my elbow is stabilized and or stay still. Um, we, you, can, you can do your biceps curl by going with the arm, the humerus parallel to your body, and then going a bit forward like that to, to a squeezing, to a more squeezing, like a big contraction. But each time I would do that, it would say hi. It's still the way. Flexing, yeah. So every time I would do biceps, it was preacher curl, whatever the angle, but brace and like this, not moving or incline behind like that and staying there always. This really forced me to do the work with the biceps. And the pose at the top also, just like for back, when people uh, tell me they have trouble to feel their back and make it work, when I'm coaching them, I say, okay, we're going to do this row and this vertical pull down, whatever. At the end of the movement, flex and pause one second. You go down, flex, pause one second. And you, do, you don't do that all the time. It's just a nice way to make sure you finish in the good position and you're actually using the muscles that are supposed to work. Because you, on, a, on a row, you cannot be there and squeeze and hold if you're just going with your arm. If you're just doing that and you, I tell you to pause, something is going to move here. So we immediately know you're not doing it good. But if you do it good and you finish here and you squeeze, you'll be like, oh, this is going to, this is warm now in behind. Same thing with the biceps, just here, squeeze, squeeze. And that's basically it. Also, the fact is that they are pretty short. So many normal exercises for me did not work, or it would be the gap here which is pure chundan that would get sore. So mm. if the biceps is right there and I'm getting sore here, right there, something's off because it's a tendon. That's like do, doing chest and you get sore right there. Uh, is it good? Is it bad? I, I have doubts, you know. So trying to get exercise that give me that fatigue or, or soreness, but right inside, you know, as, as in the middle as possible of the muscle, these are basically the, most, the, the exercise that made me able to catch up with the biceps. And now when I flex them, I know how to use them under load. And uh, I'm now able to, mer to muscle out better the load. And it's all thanks to finding exercise that allowed me to build a muscle mind connection. Because prior to that, just doing the anatomical flexing the elbow, it did not work. So, yeah. Oh, that makes yeah, so it sounds like exercise selection plays a big part, but also the way you just talk through that, you kind of like almost were like a detective and you investigated what the problem was and then you tried to figure out, okay, yeah. how can I solve this? I am curious, yeah. did you, do you feel that maybe working in a higher uh, rep range initially to develop the mind muscle connection is useful? Um, that's been my experience. Yeah. Like, or it doesn't matter as long as you have the right exercise selection. I think it's really individual. I'm not a high rep guy. I do not like high rep, but I tried that because I had the same thought as you. I'm like, okay, I'm trying to build a muscle mind connection. And so it will have to burn. So I'm going to do high rep. Okay. In the work now, I have no idea why, because on other muscle for, for example, the quads at, at first I had trouble doing the quads because I was doing squats, back squat, and it was all going to the lower back and the glutes. So I was doing high rep leg extension and it worked. So I was thinking for my biceps, okay, high rep, let's go. And it did not work. So I was like, wait a minute, I'm doing my high rep work, but it's burning weird. It's burning again, you know, here in the gap and forearm again. <laughs> so, okay, maybe it's how I'm doing them and maybe it's the curl I'm doing and not the rep range. Just like for the quads. Back squat for me at first, and even for now because of my, uh, like my bone structure, it's, not, it's never really always squat. It's always glutes and, and low back. But front squat for me was like the best exercise ever for my quads. Because on front squat, you're just forced to go down and just flexing and extending your knee. There is no hip component or barely. 
And with biceps, I had to find this thing where it's like help of flexion and the biceps just can't escape the load. It can't escape the work. There is no forearm, there is no front delt to help you. Um, so as always, um, if simple work, do simple. If simple do not work, okay, now we have the authorization to be like, okay, this might be a bit more complex and I will need to try and have more sophistication in my training approach. Awesome. Um, actually, I have one more here. You said this quite a while ago. I wonder if it's still the case. You said the chest. I hate the chest. It's not beautiful or useful to have a big chest. Do you still feel, <laughs> feel that way? Yeah. 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 So do you, but I, you still, my chest is bigger and I will train it more, but it's because, um, uh, you have seen my video with Luca Guif, which is like a friend of mine with a highly advanced French, uh, bodybuilder. Yeah. Um, he, he, he made me like a chest pump, not chest training. I still feel like I'm losing my time. Just I'm wasting my time just doing chest, but at least now when I have chest pump, I'm like, oh, okay. Pretty, oh, I, I, I like it. Okay, it's pretty, oh, okay. You know, <laughs> and also I think it was, I mean, it's really weird because I have only heard about a few strong men that experienced it. So strong men are basically doing just deadlift and over press variation to get better at the sport. But most of them at some point have to do way more horizontal pressing, especially close with bench to first um, strengthen the triceps, but also get a bit more chest mass because they are, they, are, they are starting to have a, an imbalance of too much delt uh, and too much back and not enough chest. And well, I think it started to happen to me because, well, on strength wise, I'm basically stronger vertical than incline, which is weird. And I'm nearly as strong vertical pressing wise than horizontal pressing wise, which is, I, I don't know if it's a good thing. I don't think so. And it happened to, to me to have like basically weird muscle knot uh, and sensation, especially with the uh, small, uh, how to say it in English, uh, pectoral minor, you know, inside, in, yeah. beneath. Yeah. And especially on the right side, it would always cramp or not when I was doing dips. And it's almost like my chest would not be able to soak in the load, despite having the delt and the triceps as distanced, and it would just cramp immediately. And I also had a uh, coracobrachialis knot on the left side, right here, uh, huh. who played me again on the horizontal press. And each time it felt like I was doing the press and I go down, 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 and it's right there around mid range. It's like my chest is like, okay, fuck it, bye. So from wow. here to here, it's like something is supposed to work and it doesn't work. Um, and it's not really normal. And so I started to do more chest and now it disappeared. Now if I'm under load, I can you see it, I can flex it and just do my thing. But just two years ago, I could not do that. I was like this and then bye-bye. And it's all soft, you see? All soft, yeah, um, it's not flexing. So I was okay. starting to have shoulder issue because not enough chest training. <laughs> okay. Normally, it's too much chest and not enough back. Uh, I did the reverse. That's funny. And now That's it's gone, and uh, now it's fine. I have much more. There is much more thickness. There is much more strength, and I have li I have no shoulder little issues now compared to a few months to a few years ago. So okay. I still do not like it. I still do do think it's like it's the last thing you should care about, aesthetic wise compared to all the muscle, like the delt and the lats and the V taper and good, in a good set of arms and a nice quad sweep, you know, but okay. You should still do it a little bit. Yeah. Okay. That's funny. All right. So the next one is uh, a little bit different. So I think you're uniquely positioned to answer this because you're into bodybuilding and you also do modeling. What is something overrated and what is something underrated with looks look maxing? One overrated and one, and one underrated. underrated. Yes. Uh, the one underrated, I would say, is skin health, skin quality. Which is also why uh, I'm really not um, interested into doing steroids. Because these guys, you see them from afar and they have the best physique. And you see them up close with a good camera quality. Their skin... It looks like sand. You know, when you rub sand, 
you know, and then you 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 wash it off the skin afterward. It looks like this. Like, why would you do that? You know, mm -hmm. and this is something in modeling that often came uh, for me as I'm very white, very very pale. So I was always a nightmare for photographer. You know, to set up the ISO and the all the setup, especially yeah. outside. Uh, but they always told me at least your skin is really smooth and it catches the light really well and it's a nice skin. Um, so I think one of the most like underrated thing about look maxing is just skin quality, skin care. And I do not think people realize how much it is it is a big uh, tie in with the diet quality because I do not have like 40 creams and product uh, in my luggage. I just eat good and I just use some time, uh, some exfoliation uh, and I uh, wash myself with Marseille soap, which is like one of the best soap ever, like top three in the entire world. And that's it. That, that is it. Uh, and when I need to scrub my face, I use a mixture with honey that I do myself with a little bit of lemon juice and I just apply it. And you wait 50, 20 minutes and that should just rub it off, you know, with like a shower flower, you know, to scrub a bit. Um, and if you have a really oily skin, what is extremely good is to use, um, I do not know the exact word in English, but basically you do your coffee and use coffee ground. And when it's done, you're supposed to dispose of it. Well, you can keep it and use it as exfoliation excellent. There is vitamin inside. There is antioxidant inside. And we have um, the roasting basically mechanism uh, preparation. You also have um, like polyphenol things. So basically, it cleans up and uh, helps your skin quality. Uh, and there is like B3, magnesium, uh, stuff like that inside coffee, at least when it's a good coffee. So you keep it and you just rub it a little bit, you know, uh, and then you wash it off and your skin is silky smooth. Silky smooth. Okay. You can try it, Varun. I, I, I bet money on that. Your skin is silky smooth. And you just need to, you know, to, if you have a shower, you just need, if it goes a bit on the on the wall, you just need to wash it off, right? That's fine. But your skin isn't perfect. And I think this is like the most underrated thing ever about look smacking. You want to look good and your skin is trash. Doesn't work. Uh, and it gave me, it gave me time to think about the most overrated thing. And I think it's about like the, um, you know, the scale with your face thing, you know, with, I think the it's really small. Yeah, with like reddits and everything. I think it's, I do understand the logic. I really do. But it's like, oh, if you're not like a five out of 10, they're basically telling you, you can go hang yourself. Yeah. But what the hell, bro? It's like you, your life is over if you're not looking like a top model. But by default, a top model is like, 0.5% of the whole world population. And you're supposed to look like that. And if you do not, you should just end your life. I think it's... I, I think that, what's that called? That's a black pill, right? Or I, I'm not yes, into that. Exactly. That's, right? that's, okay. Yes, exactly. Yes, that's a black pill. Because it's not even like, um, like, like a red pill. Red pill is like a hard pill to swallow, but it's kind of a truth or a fact. That's how it's presented. But like this is just pure... Uh, it, it's free depression. It's free depression for you. You did nothing. You're, you're yourself, you know, and you come on this forum and you're trying to find a way to better yourself. And the guy is basically saying you do not have a recovery face and your life. That's that's extremely uh, disturbing to think of that. Uh, uh, and also, except if you have been disfigured, like with acid or burn, or you have like a huge birth deflect, anyone can look at least decent average, like four to six out of 10 on their skin, sure. anymore. You lose your fat, you take care of your skin. If you're a man, you know, you, you know, the jawline, skin quality, the beard, you know, the, the style as a whole, you try to not have like bags under your eyes, not to be too puffy, you know, mm -hmm. all of that, you can like gain three points, easy, plus a body, plus being happy in your life. So you can see it on your face, you know, yeah. And yeah, I think this scale thing can give you like a, a gauge, as I say, you know, it's like, oh, okay, this explains why my friend has a lot of success with women and not me. Sure. Or the reverse, you know, 
uh, why are women attracted to me like magnet and I do I ju I'm just breathing I'm just standing there and my friend is complaining because it doesn't happen to him but that's it after that it's all about self-development and um, just doing your best basically but your face aesthetic your face symmetry is what it is and it is linked to hormone health as well so you want to look better start on your health because a man who is low testosterone and a man who is high testosterone, the same face, the same bone, it doesn't look the same. Awesome. Cool. Um, so you mentioned that you've learned exercise order to avoid injury from John Meadows and that you kind of yeah. leverage some of his principles. Can you maybe yeah. explain how an intermediate lifter can think about exercise order uh, when they're programming? Um, okay, so I'm going to go with the fact that it's intermediate for bodybuilding purposes. So yeah. you basically have a two plate bench for one rep. You have one plate OHP, three plate squat, four plates deadlift. In that situation, when hypertrophy is your main goal, you do not necessarily need to keep the big three and the OHP, but you need variation of them. How do you choose the variation? You choose a variation that is pain free that is enjoyable for you, that is available to you and will give you the drive and the, the want, literally, the motivation to progress upon. For example, for me, I never cared about the bench press, but I was okay training hard on my tips or my inclined press, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing is regarding the joint, because the joint will always be your limiting factors. So I might as well immediately spot and uh, assess how to do that. And for me, uh, two years ago, I had a urinary infection and I took antibiotics that uh, are now forbidden in France and in whole Europe, I believe even the whole world. And because these are extremely aggressive of a tendon. So I went to the ER and the, the, the doctor uh, checked me. She saw I was muscular and she gave me that. Mm. As, you know, I, I still have trouble to understand the logic, but you know, whatever. Sure. Basically, in one week, every little tendonitis I ever had in my life fled up. Plus, aponevrisis under my both feet. So, uh, it took months to come back from that. And I still have my left elbow on the pointy side here with, um, uh, with painful or cranky. So, yeah. to come back to that, I'm, I'm giving all these information for your context to answer you so my elbow is cranky i'm used to do french press so with dumbbell like that with 46 to 50 kilogram and i can't do that anymore because it's hurting but i still want to train my arms and my triceps without aggravating it what do i do john Mido experienced a shit ton of little tweaks and strain and strain and basically understood that to train a muscle Safely, you first start with the most joint-friendly variation and you go from this one joint-friendly variation to the least friendly load variation. Most of the time, it's a shortened position at first. And as you go through a workout, you go to more a lengthened position. So for the triceps, the shortened position is right there behind, like a kickback doing that. Because you shorten it at the, sh at the, the shoulder and with a movement, you can really squeeze it and shorten it on both hands with extended arm like that. So you start with that. Then you move on to a mid-range uh, difficulty or like an in-between. So that could be a skull crusher like that or a push-down where, you, where your arm is a bit in front of you or even parallel, uh, you move parallel to your body like that. So it's like push-down, basically. And you finish with the most stretch and the least friendly, which is here. Because okay. when you're like this, it's less than here. And when you're yeah. here, it's lengthened on both sides. So there is a lot of stretch. So the joint is in the least, is in the most precarious position. But since you're warmed up, since you're already fatigued, and since you already did heavy work at first, you can do lighter work, you can do safer work, and it's still going to be effective because you're still going to be able to train close to failure or at failure. And this is what I learned from John Meadow, basically. And you can apply the same thing for, for example, the knees. You start with leg extension, then you do leg press, and then you do squats instead of the reverse that most people are doing. 
Yeah, for triceps, I'm doing it the way that you're saying, starting at the shortened position. But for legs, I'm starting with squats and then leg press. So that's interesting to, to think through that. Yeah, but it's fine. You know, if you have no joint problem, do not go and try to invent problem. Of course, if you have yeah, no issue, yeah. Do it right. But if you have even when you start to have issue, it's like okay, what I'm doing is causing problem. Where, how, why, when, yep. and, and then, right. Well, and that's what John Milo really put in front of the scene. Because prior to that, it's like you know, well, don't be a pussy. Just put elbow sleeve and keep going. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Before him, it was like it was like that basically. Same thing for Chess, the guy who had like almost tear, he spent so much time doing heavy inclined barbell. Uh, and he was like, you oh, know, maybe I will just start with peg deck and I will finish with incline and I'm going to do in the Smith to be more safe. <laughs> and I mean, it sounds so simple and logical, but eight years ago, it wasn't. So yeah, it's also funny. We spend so much time talking about optimal, but injury prevention is so important because you can't be optimal if you can't train. Exactly. And optimal is not like a yes or no. It's more like a spectrum in a sense, you know, is yeah, I'm scale. putting enough thing on your side to have a productive session? Yes or no. And that's it. Yeah. Cool. Um, so something I always find interesting is the origin story. So my understanding is the name Hersoviak came from a dream that you had when you were 13 years old, where you dreamt that you were a Norse warrior. Can yeah. you maybe explain that dream and the impact it had on your life? Yeah, it, I know it sounds so fucking cheesy right now, but um, uh, awesome. yeah, I was 11, 11 or 13, yeah, something like that. Uh, and so I, I'm, uh, I'm dreaming, you know, I'm, I'm, I have boots, you know, I have high, like heavy boots and I'm just jumping in the water, uh, which is like a, a beach. And then I'm advancing, and then it's like it's all mixed up. And then I'm like in a in a melee, you know, with like the shield wall and everything. And prior to that, I want to just say on the record, I never saw like there was no Viking movie, no Viking TV show. Okay, so I had no idea, really. So I'm like I'm just this like a shield wall, and I'm on the second uh, second uh, rank, you know, and I'm it's just the spear doing that, and then I'm in the third rank with a, um, like an axe going over like that. And then I see some fur and fire, and then someone is shouting as of yak, and I turn around. Interesting. And did you start using that name like right away for video games, or did it take some time for you to you took know, some time. start? Took some it time. Took some time, yeah. Uh, was video game there. wise, I never was the type of person to uh, to do like multiplayer, like you know, with pseudo and everything. So it took some time. And I think the first time I ever used it was when I registered on uh, Superphysic, which is a forum about training and bodybuilding, and it's a French forum. Uh, and I think this is the first time I ever used it, because I just remembered. And I was uh, I was nearly 17 at the time. I was like 16 and a few months, something like that. OK. So if you're playing I with... it for everything. So it's like it's my with... team. Is it your League of Legends and your Steam name now? Is it for everything? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's everywhere. Awesome. Cool. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw some uh, pictures up on the screen. And for the first one, just tell me what you learned from this person or this book. So the first okay. one is a book by Frederick de Lavier. Yeah. Uh... It's so hard to tell you in one sentence because I basically learned everything with these books. I learned how to uh, program. I learned how to understand what is a effective set, what is an effective rep. I learned what is good form. I learned how biomechanic uh, works. I learned how your own bone structure influence your injuries, your muscle development. Uh, so your strong point and weak point. Uh, I learned about a supplement because they have like a supplement guidebook. Uh, I learned about warm up, about stretching, about uh, spinal decompression, uh, about rest day, about uh, the influence of the hormonal system on on, on bodybuilding. I, yeah, I learned everything with these books. Awesome. All right. The next one is. Uh either a fun story or something you learned when you met Tom Platt in person. Oh, man. 
Fuck. Oh. That's always it's, it's, it's been close to a year now, and I uh, and I still think about it sometimes. Um, I, I learned that. Uh, I mean, it's, I I don't know if it's something in in America water. But it's like you guys sometimes you do not understand what uh, feeling down means. It's like this country was made for highly motivated and high energy person, and some way somehow if you work hard. It's going to work it out, and you're going to reap all the success that you deserve. And it's like Tom Platz, he, he feels like the kind of guy who just wake up and he's like, okay, what? let's go. What are we doing today? You know, uh, whatever it is, you know, if it's bodybuilding or when he was working in like at, the, at a desk job about like technical and finance and stuff. Um, and also when he did the seminar, it's, it's like I learned that if you work hard, you will get uh, something out of it. And it may come in an unexpected way, but you'll still got it at some point. This is what he told me. It's like you, uh, he, I mean, obviously he's also a Trump fan. So I guess there is this entrepreneur, business driven side of him, you know, I or see. very let's go get it uh, uh, um, behavior. Uh, but it's like, yeah, uh, he told me, you know, like, whatever you want, you do it. And you can learn anything you want, a new language, a new skill, if you just work hard enough and consistent enough. And if you really want to make it in whatever endeavor you want, it's like, just do it. You know? Awesome. And uh, fact or fiction, he told you that you look like a Parisian lumberjack with a nice build. No, he, he told me that. Literally, what you would. He said, you look like a Parisian lumberjack. Is there a forest over there? He asked me, is there a from forest and you're cutting the tree? I'm like, no, there's a forest. <laughs> and I'm not even Parisian. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. All right. So for the next one, tell me uh, what you would work out with this person if you met them in real life. Steve Reeves. Full, full body. Full body. Full body. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Henry Rollins. Uh, do some grappling, some grappling or like MMA. Awesome. Awesome. And the last one here, what if you met with Thor? It doesn't have to be Chris Hemsworth. It can be any, any version of Thor that you want. Uh, I'm supposed to train with him. Yeah. Do whatever you want with him. You can train with okay. him, you know, whatever you want. That, I mean, at, at, at first, uh, Thor is a, He's an explorator, you know, he's mankind protector. So I think he's like moving around a lot, you know, with his, um, with his chariot. Um, I think I would just go like on a, on a trip with him, like an adventure. Like, okay, let's go. Yeah, that's to focus on giants. All right, with me. <laughs> and you have, uh, you have Thor's hammer as a pendant, right? The, uh, yes. Mjolnir. The Mjolnir. Yeah. I always butcher how to say it. Yeah, there it is. So. Awesome. Well, uh, Axel, thank you so much for your time today. Where can everyone find you? Uh, on YouTube, on Instagram, I have my uh, 